So energy is the big problem with trying to make computers faster, no matter what scale you're at. Um, uh, this was a, a, a project I was involved in looking at how many megawatts a computer would use if we tried to build one. Um, and this, this usual scaling means take into consideration Moore's law scaling. Uh, when, with Moore's law, the, sh the wires get shorter, so it doesn't take as much energy to move the data around. The transistors get smaller and so on. Um, but uh, even with Moore's law scaling, which are those step functions, we still got up to a design point for an exa exaflop computer of about um, 200, me uh, 200 megawatts. Um, so how much is 200 megawatts for those of you who are not too used to paying electricity bills um, at your home or at your university because somebody else does it for you? It costs a million dollars roughly per megawatt per year um, to run one of the, to, to buy electricity. Ver prices vary across the country and so on, but, but roughly speaking, think of it as a million dollars. So that means to run one of these exaflop computers would require $200 million just to pay the electrical bill every year. So um, we're not going to do that. So we are trying to figure out how to, to, to at least shrink that down by a factor of about um, a factor of 10. The Hopper system today is about, about a 3 megawatt computer, so I spend about $3 million a year, um, a little less because we get good pricing, but um, every year paying the electrical bill for Hopper. And this isn't just a problem with supercomputers, it's a problem for um, security, so the NSA had problems because they're browning out all of Baltimore um, when they turn their computers on. Um, Google says, it, you know, there's an article that, that Google de details and defends its use of electricity. Um, so they're using about 260 um, um, megawatts, so about a quarter of a gigawatt in all of their data sensor centers. I'm kind of guessing they have about a dozen of them, which is where I came up with a 20 megawatt number per data center. Um, and worldwide, the data center power um, was about 26 gigawatts, so $26 billion spent um, powering up these data centers. So energy is a big problem here in computing. Um, and so if you go into computer science, you can help solve these problems. There's the cell phone processor, um, and there is the, uh, this is an Intel Nehalem processor, so a high-end um, server processor. The, uh, the server processor is, um, is, is 100 times faster, 1,000 times faster than the cell phone processor, but is... Um, Let's see, sorry, the server processor is 10 times faster than the cell phone processor, but it uses 1,000 times more power, so it's actually less efficient. The cell phone processor is 100 times more energy efficient in terms of the number of operations it can do per, per watt. So um, this has to do with some basic physics and, and the way these devices work, which I won't go into, but if you've taken your double E courses, it's V squared F, and it all turns, you have to raise the power when you raise the frequency, and so that's why um, these, these little tiny lightweight processors that are very simple um, and have slower, are a little bit slower actually, much more energy efficient. So the big question for us is, are we going to build our next supercomputers out of um, graphics processors? Fastest supercomputer in the world in China um, builds out of graphics processors today. There's another one being installed in, um, at Oak Ridge National Labs, which will also have graphics processors in it. Game processors, a few years ago, the fastest supercomputer in the world, one of the first petaflop systems, uh, was, a, um, was built out of uh, cell processors. So those are PS3 processors built into a supercomputer. Um, or are we going to build it out of something like cell phones? So lots of interesting questions there. How are we going to program the thing? And so on. So um, as I mentioned before, all of the uh, processors today now, it's not just a problem for supercomputing. They're all these... Um, are these uh, uh, parallel processors, and there's our Moore's Law line, um, just to prove to you that, uh, that really the trend in Moore's Law is continuing, um, but the processor performance is the red one. That was what leveled off in uh, around 2004, and instead this green line is about number of cores per chip, so we're getting a lot more cores per chip rather than getting faster processors. Um, I was in a, a, another study group with um, a number of people looking at computing performance with, with the National Academies. Um, Sam Fuller, who was the chair of that group, put together this nice graph that kind of summarizes the previous picture and says this is the expectation gap between where we kind of, everybody is used to Moore's Law producing not just more transistors, but actually producing more per computing performance because the architects figured out how to turn those transistors into faster and faster computers. And it allowed you to have more memory, it allowed you to have more um, it allowed you to have bigger data sets, bigger operating systems, and, um, and allowed you to do a lot more things. So this is the kind of, most computer science don't think about this particular part of the problem because they're off designing algorithms and thinking about great things to do with computers, um, but that's the expectation gap where things will not happen that we, um, we're kind of expecting them to. Um, Dave Liddell, who's actually a venture capitalist, works in the venture capital um, industry, um, had this great analogy to the computer industry um, having to do with what happens when you fly jet um, jet engines, and he said that the, the, the planes, and he said that the, uh, 
it, 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 there's these two different speeds that you care about when you're flying a jet. One of them is the, the, the maximum speed at which you can safely fly at all. Um, so don't exceed that because you can't fly safely. Um, but the other one is called maneuvering speed. So maneuvering speed is where you can fly in a straight line, but you can't turn because you're going so fast that you can't actually change course at all. And he said the computer industry was running at maneuvering speed, which means we figured out that Intel x86, you know, AMD and so on, processors were the way to do it. So we just made them faster and faster, and we could keep doing that. Um, and then something major happened, which was 2004, um, we, we, they got too hot, and, and the, the computer industry couldn't really turn. So all I could do was to say, oh, we know what we'll do. We've got more transistors. We'll just stick two of them on the chip. Now we'll stick four of them on the chip and so on. And um, so the computer industry has to make a major, major change here. So the last kind of reason to study computer science is because there's a, uh, there's a lot of great things that you can do with computers that are fun um, to do. In addition to all these science problems, um, I will just mention briefly the um, computer music. So you may not think that if you're a musician that you can benefit from computers, but David Wessel, who works uh, at the um, Center for um, new, new Music and Audio Technology, um, he created this loudspeaker array. He's also a practicing musician, a performing musician. He's built a musical instrument out of the track pads from a bunch of computer systems. So I think he's got a five by five grid of those, each one connected to a different sound or voice, and he uses that to play music. So computers get used in industry, and to my surprise, he said, um, you, musicians have an insatiable um, appetite for more comp computer power. And the last thing um, I'll show is, is a little video the, from um, the graphics group from James O'Brien here at uh, Berkeley, and I just want to show this. This is looking at uh, computer games. Um, many of you may recognize this. Uh, my 13-year-old son certainly does. This is Star Wars Force, Force Unleashed. And um, so just a little bit of this, and then I'll try to. So this is, this is, of course, an interactive game. Those of you who don't play games, they might not be so familiar with it. And let me see if I can move it here a little bit. There we go. Um, so these are now. But what I want you to see is the mesh that they're putting. So how do you simulate these things? Well, what are you doing in a game? You're simulating the physical world. When you're simulating the physical world, you're building these models, um, and they're built out of these things that kind of look like um, these, uh, you know, the, that looks kind of like the, the, the world, the mesh. These are finite elements, and indeed, that's exactly what's going on both with the people and with the brick wall. So there's a brick wall, and people flying into the brick wall. This is what happens now if we change the physical characteristics, the, the theory of that brick wall, and make it rubber instead. And so it, uh, um, you can see you get very different behavior. So um, I'll just end with a quote from um, E.O. Lawrence, who is the founder of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Computational science is um, necessarily collaborative. Um, you have all these great people working together to solve, pro who are experts in physics and chemistry and medicine, in biology and climate change, um, and you get them together with computer scientists and mathematicians, um, and that's what he said in his uh, Nobel laureate acceptance speech as well. So why, why study computer science? Um, for all the reasons I said before, plus you get to work with a bunch of great people um, in a lot of different disciplines.